We know that Ramkinka began to do large sculptures around 1931. And we have the Sujada before this, and then we have the reliefs that he did for the Shamali building. We can already see there is a shift that is coming in Indian sculpture through these outdoor works. But this work, the Sandal family, done around 38, 1938-39, is a major departure, both in the work of Ramkinka as well as in the history of modern Indian sculpture. It brings together two different things. On the one hand, it brings together a kind of thematic shift, the local tribal peasants, the Santals, into the main focus. And you have this monumental work which shows the simple people who probably didn't find a big place in modern art right valorized into the middle of the campus. And that is a thematic shift and also the scale itself makes a statement. The other aspect is that this sculpture also draws upon his experience, his understanding of the classical Indian sculptures. So in its language, it brings together the modern and the classical, and thematically it brings together the people who were absolutely invisible, probably in a lot of contemporary art, into the public and gives them a large monumental scale and presence. So in both these, it is a great piece of work and a departure in modern Indian art. Ramkinka thought about building a sculpture. I mean, they were thinking always in terms of an inner structure that blossomed forth, that filled itself up into being the final object. So, when Ramkinka taught sculpture, first, it was the main armature that, uh, how was the, how is the armature built? Well, probably many. Uh, sort of a sculptor school of that time also did the same. But what I encountered here was, it is not that you put a lump and then you press it into shape. It is as if you built a kind of an armature on which the shapes can grow in various directions at various levels of condition, which was the same thing as Nandalal did. When Nandalal did drawings even from nature, he made a small armature. Then that armature he could develop, putting in various details and all. And each time, the same armature produced a new kind of object. So for 
a person like Ram Kinka to sort of convince you that from the same armature you can have a more realistic form and a more abstract form was very easy. I mean, he didn't have to do it. So it's a matter of growth. It is a matter of growth in various directions. चोखेर जालेर लागलो जो आर दुखेर पारावारे ओ चोखेर जालेर लागलो जो आर हुलो कानाए कानाए चोखेर जालेर लागलो जो आर दुखे आमार तोरी छिलो चिनार कुले बाधो चोखेर जालेर लागलो जो आर दुखेर पारावारे ओ चां 
The sculpture of Ram Kinkar is usually called the thresher or the harvester. It was done in 1943 and the immediate context for the sculpture was an international competition called the Unknown Political Prisoner. Of course, when this competition was held in the context of the post-war European situation, it, the unknown political prisoner was the prisoner of war. But when Ramkinka decided to uh, do a piece for this competition, for him it was the peasant who was the unknown political prisoner. And this is quite typical of his way of thinking. And this headless, really a monumental figure that he thinks and represents the unknown political prisoner, not only of that particular context, but of all times. This sculpture is one of the last that Ram Kinkar did in Shantaniketan. It began in 1930s and he went on doing one after the other last sculptures on this campus. And um, in 1955-56 he, he did the sculpture which is usually called the milk call. Over the years his art changed, its style of working changed, not in techniques but in the way of visualization. And if the milk call was one of the last ones in which you see the evolution of a kind of sculptural style of large-scale working. Here we see the Santal women going to the mill in the morning, the rice mills around in the morning, and which also marks a change in life in the surroundings. People who are peasants have now turned into factory workers. And he also has a more celebratory kind of approach in this work, which is something he kept continuing, but the quality of the work did change. It becomes more baroque, it becomes more effusive in its representation of movement and so on. His idea of making sculpture then did change from the more restrained pre-classical art style that you find in the Sandal family to this one, which is more like a baroque style within his own framework, of course. any other art school where they toss sculpture, especially when you do a portrait study. He used to make a kind of what you call cross-sectional study of the head, for instance. And he used to make a kind of a, almost a thin structure which showed the profile and then another structure which 
went across it which showed the other thing and then filled it in. So the way, then the bone structure came, then the air came, and which was very particularly original at that time, for me at least. Because I have seen other art schools later where they put a lump and then make it into an object, then press it into shape. But it's not there. It's not again very structural. And that's why you find that when you compare many of Ramkinkar's portraits to the portraits of others, they are terribly tense, structural, almost as if the, uh, the muscles and the bones were welding together and building a structure. he added thing and made it into a piece of sculpture. He was not a, a kind of a sculptor. He took a sort of an inert mass and carved it down. I mean, he was not. So, if uh, due to certain circumstances, he had to sort of a carve things, uh, well, he had to leave it to others to carve on the basis of a maquette he made. I mean, that may be true of various other sculptors too. And then the other thing is that when he took on a sort of a ye, uh, a commission which needed carved sculpture, like that of the Reserve Bank. Probably he would have done a much better thing if he 